This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 312. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? This is Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with today's awesome, incredible, handsome co-host, Mr. David Green. How you doing, handsome David? Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> it's the first time you've ever said anything nice about me, actually. You had this great look on your face that whole time. That's awesome. Quizzical. Like, why is he saying this? Where's the insult going to come from? I know. Mm, yeah. I'm actually doing super good. We put six houses under contract this week on the David Ooh. Green team. Almost all people that are looking to house hack. So as everyone knows, the Bay Area is super expensive right now. So people come to me and say, David, I want to buy a house out here, but it's expensive. And we find ways to get them properties where they can rent out rooms, rent out parts of the home, bring their, their cost way down. And then when you factor in like the tax benefits and yeah. the principal pay down, they're pretty much living for free. And I just want to say house hacking is a real legit thing. It's not just some concept that gets thrown around on bigger pockets. Like there's people living in really expensive areas, getting homes that are going to be appreciating a ton and not paying that much money when you do this right it's pretty much exactly what i'm doing right now it's uh, it's amazing yeah. so awesome awesome yeah i love it well let's get to today's show and introduce today's guest today we're talking with a guy who's all over the bigger pockets forums his name's james masadi or masadi right and he yeah the hand thing he invests out in Delaware, uh, lives on the East Coast, invests in Delaware, uh, works a full-time job. We're going to talk about how he does that. How does he do it while working a full-time job? He's got some really good tips there. And then he has a, a few horror stories, we'll call them, about real estate and things that you can learn. You know, like you can learn from your own mistakes or you can learn from other people's, I don't want to call them mistakes, but their, their problems, the horror things that they go through, right? Because real estate's not always easy. And James is really open and honest about the hard times as well as the good times. So uh, you're going to love it, how he uses private money, how he burrs, how he does deals with no money down. But what he, he has a really good point about how no money doesn't mean broke. Listen for that. And uh, that's pretty much, uh, again, that's today's show. You're going to love it. But before we bring in James, let's get to today's quick, quick tip. tip. All right, so today's quick tip is very, very short. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. We have a spot on the show called Deal, uh, a spot on the website called Deal Diaries. Basically, we want everybody who's a Bigger Pockets member, we would love you to start telling other people about your deals, right? Because it helps you stand out as somebody who's actually doing it. So if you've done a deal recently, uh, go into your Bigger Pockets profile and you can look for the section that says Deal Diaries. You can upload information about your deal, uh, just like James does today in telling us all about his deals. You can do the same thing without being on the show. And of course, if you want to be on the show at some point, if you've done you know, a dozen deals or more, go to biggerpockets.com slash guest and maybe you'll get on the show as well. Now let's bring in James to get to the interview because you guys are going to learn and grow a ton from James' honesty. Let's get to it. All right, James, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing today? Oh, pretty fantastic. So I got to point out something first before we get started. I discovered that you live in, 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 in like my town, like apparently. What, what's the town name? Turnersville? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, I live in uh, Turnersville. So I thought I thought that was a joke. And then I, I asked you and you said no. So it's, it's not a joke. Yeah. You know, we uh, we got a local Bigger <laughs> Pockets meetup we've been doing uh, this wow. past year. So if, if Brandon Turner ever wants to come out to Turnersville, uh, yeah. you know, that'd that, be pretty that cool. May have, that may have to happen someday. There you go. There's, there's a lot of like Greensville and Greensland and green stuff, but yeah. that was my oh, first I'm, Turner's. I'm bill. clearly more influential and famous than you are, <laughs> but I'm glad you finally got your first little city. I mean, that's a big step for you, Brandon. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Although I think you, you have to actually be Italian. You have to, your, your last name has to end with a, a vowel to live here. Uh, turn yo I can do that. <laughs> he's not good at that yeah we had this problem with uh santana stasso remember that brandon yep. yeah yeah, just, yeah, struggling, yeah, I, struggling. <laughs> yeah I, I i struggle okay so tell me how you say your last name masadi masadi okay yeah. do i say like masadi it's like exactly, the hand thing right? exactly yes yeah, it's, it's one of those everybody's like oh a lot of people kind of get it messed up they say like, masadi like maserati and i'm like no it's masadi like maserati because everybody says the car name wrong oh really <laughs> Yeah, so it's a Maserati. Have, have world changing the way they pronounce the car as opposed to changing exactly. the way you pronounce your name. Exactly. That's a boss you know. move right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we're here uh, to talk about real estate investing, of course, today. So why don't we jump into that? And, uh, like, How did you get into real estate? What was your like entrance yeah. into it? And then walk us through that process of getting your first deal. 
Yeah. So my entrance into real estate was, I always felt like paying rent was just throwing money away. So when, um, I graduated college, I actually was looking for a place to live and decided, you know what, for what I'm paying for rent, uh, I could just try and buy my own place. And so I uh, came across a, a, a VA foreclosure back in 2008. So lots of stuff foreclosing back then. Uh, but the VA foreclosure, there was a zero down for owner occupants. And the place was kind of a mess. And uh, so basically moved in, bought that. Uh, and then over like the next year and a half, started fixing it up. And then my company relocated me to California and I started renting it out. And I'll have the same tenant for nine years now when she renews this year. So that was kind of how I got started. And then uh, back in 2015, I had a coworker uh, start working with me and he talked about real estate investing. That was kind of when I decided, you know what, I should probably get more active in doing this. And that's when I found bigger pockets and it's kind of been downhill from there. All right. Well, hopefully uphill. <laughs> uphill, downhill. Yeah, yeah it depends funny. on which way you're trying to get. Uphill would yeah, be a yeah. battle. Downhill. Okay, easier, that's I true. Guess, downhill so. easier. Yeah. yeah. If you said like, man, it's all downhill from here. It sounds so. Mm, I don't know. All right, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna keep going. All right. So you live in Turnersville, New Jersey now. So yeah. you apparently moved away from California. You made it over to New Jersey at some point. I'm yeah. I'm sorry. And yeah. uh, no, when you when you marry a Jersey girl <laughs> and she says you're moving to New Jersey, uh, mm. that's just the way it works. Yeah, that happens. All right. So you're in New Jersey and uh, you still work full time at your job, I hear. I do. Yep. Well, you can't invest in real estate and work full time at your job. So you're clearly wrong. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I did actually, so, uh, you know, I did make a change uh, in employment back in February. So it definitely was uh, more challenging. My past employer, you know, I was working five, six days a week, 14 hour days uh, and the opposite direction of my market. So again, where I live in, in South Jersey, uh, about half hour outside of Philly, I actually, all my rental properties are down in Wilmington, Delaware. So technically out of state, but it's only about a 40 minute drive from where I live. But where I was working at the time was an hour the opposite direction. So it would take me like two hours and after a 14 hour day, like I didn't want to be going to do that. So, you know, yeah. kind of made a transition. So I had a little more time and flexibility, you know, and, uh, and that sort of a thing. Well, so I want to actually bring something up here. A lot of people look at, they want to get into real estate investing and they think that they need to quit their job or they just can't invest because they work too many hours. But I, I, David and I actually both talk about this a lot. Is a person could find another job instead, like even if it paid way less, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't their ideal job, if you want to get into real estate investing and you're working 70, 80 hours a week because you got yep. some crap job, yep. it's okay to go find something that's more flexible. Like exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Or something. Okay, yeah, so that's yeah, exactly what I did. So I took, you know, awesome. a, a decent paycheck, you know, uh, pay cut, you know, I, I still make okay money and things like that, sure. you know, to support life and, and whatnot. But I was very clear when I was going in there, you know, what I was looking for in my, you know, still professional life, but that I was doing this investing thing on the side and needed to be able to have flexibility to, you know, leave work early to come and do this podcast today or go to a closing like I did last week and, you know, things along those lines. So. Yeah, that's crazy. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so let's move into uh, your, your first deal locally. So, like mm -hmm. in the in that in first of all, how did you find Wilmington, Delaware, yeah. from New Jersey? Like, why why did you choose that market? And then walk us through your first deal there. Yeah. So when I uh, again was looking to buy my first place, I was working in Delaware County, um, which is actually in Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, and my parents lived in another county and it was kind of looking, you know, where locally and, and again, just happened to find this house in, in Delaware. So then in 2015, when I was starting to look to invest, uh, I was looking locally here in South Jersey and the taxes here in Jersey are absolutely insane. So like out for my townhouse that I lived in and is one of my rentals, I was paying uh, about $1,200 a year for property taxes. My townhouse here in Jersey is uh, $5,400 a year. Um, Ooh. you know, for taxes. So trying to get things to cash flow and stuff like that was a pain. And then at that point in time, I wasn't really in a cash buying position. So trying to find flips on the MLS was difficult. And then my first one called true investment was actually on the bigger pockets marketplace. Um, there was a deal listed, uh, from a, an agent with an off market kind of listing and, you know, ended up kind of going to walking it and, uh, you know, use my first private investor on that place. And, uh, it was kind of a disaster, but I learned so much during that project that okay. it was one of those, again, never wished that first one on everybody, but I'm so happy I did it because it got me to where I am too. Sure. So what made it a disaster? I mean, you, so you found the deal on bigger pockets or somebody yeah. had advertised it on our marketplace for those who don't know, there's a, the part of bigger pockets called the bigger pockets marketplace. It's actually getting redone right now. And I think by the time this podcast airs, it'll have a whole new thing. It's like completely being redesigned. But anyway, it's a place people can go and post ads for properties that they have, properties that they want, properties that, you know, that they or you know, potential partners or, you know, bank suggestions, whatever. So anyway, that's what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. you went there, you got something, what went wrong on it? 
<laughs> and what, yeah. what what was it and then what went wrong? It was yeah, like a single so family, it was, right? Uh, it was a single family townhouse. Yeah, three bed, one bath. Um, and basically, you know, it was my first time going and going and doing all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, so I went in, you know, the they were marketing it, you know, it only needs twelve thousand dollars. They already had an appraisal done, but the person who was doing the renovations ran out of money, so they were trying to sell it fast. And I walked it, you know, thought I knew what I was doing because I read Jay Scott's book, uh, you know, and all that kind of fun stuff. But I never actually had a contractor walk it. Needless to say, I went from a twelve thousand dollar budget on theirs. And I was like, oh, this is going to be more than that. It's going to be like eighteen or twenty thousand um, turned out to be sixty five thousand. Oh, and, whoa. Uh, we, yeah, we uh, we had to rebuild literally the whole back of the house. We literally had to take the whole backside of the house down. There was a secondary foundation supporting the back of the house that had started to cave in. So we had to take the wall off, support it. And then it rained for an entire month. So I had the whole back of my house tarped up and with like plywood. They couldn't do any electrical or anything. So I said just timeline, scope. Uh, you know, it was my first experience with a contractor stealing from me. So again, it was just so many different little things, you know, in that deal that was just, you know, it, it was uh, quite the learning experience. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So, okay. So I get this email from a guy the other day and this guy says a, a similar story actually. And I won't say his name. And if you're listening, dude, I feel for you. But he basically says, look, I took all of my savings that was for my kid's college education and I dumped it into a, a real estate deal. Mm-hmm. And my budget of $15,000, it looks like more like, or maybe it was 30. Now it looks like more like 60, right? Yep. He's like, I feel like I lost my kid's education. I just want to throw in the towel. I'm done. It was very, very similar story to this. You know? yep. And, and my answer to him, I'm curious of what you would say to him being that you were in this exact position. I told yep. him, Basically, what we've said on the show here before is that the first deal, it matters in that you're gaining knowledge and experience. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that much. Like one deal is not making you rich or making you poor typically. Mm -hmm. So don't throw in the towel, right? Like take the lessons you learned. I mean, so that was the first piece of advice I gave him. The second piece of advice I gave him is, look, if you're like he's having contractor problems, he's only spent like 17 grand so far. I said, Mm -hmm. maybe as a I don't want to call it a punishment to yourself. And I think, David, you disagree with me on this point. But I said, maybe. The way you you say, okay, well, I screwed up. The way I'm going to fix this is by spending every night and weekend doing all the things that I can do on the property to mm-hmm. earn back that money that I just lost. So I'm going to go and do the painting myself. I'm going to go, you know, do everything little that I can do to cut that budget from the 60 now that I'm thinking back down to 30. Uh, and then the third thing I told them was, uh, you know, j- just hang in there again because, like, you know, if if you take the knowledge, you take the experience. Real estate's very forgiving, right? Very forgiving. Like you could go over. 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand in your budget. And at some point in the future, that doesn't actually matter because the property will likely appreciate far more than that. Now, I mean, it still sucks to go over that. You shouldn't go over it. But mm-hmm. anyway, that was my response to him. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Or uh, we'll go James first and then I'll ask David the same. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the the biggest thing that I, you know, again, at this point, my investing, I mean, we, we use private investors for pretty much everything, but, you know, we still have that cash reserve. And so, you know, I'm a big proponent. It's my business model is, you know, kind of the no money, you know, our investors fund the acquisition and the refi rehabs. And, and that was the case on that project. But, you know, again, that doesn't mean you don't have to come with anything. So for me, it's also about keeping in mind just what are your resources? So on that deal, right? I mean, I did have to take out, you know, a loan for my 401k to get it done. I did, you know, open up a zero interest credit card. Like, again, you have to be flexible to kind of figure it out, right? And then what did you learn from it? So it's it's not so much, again, like the mistakes are going to happen. And if you just sit there and, you know, analysis paralysis, you're never going to get through it. But, you know, just trying to be able to say, you know what, okay, how do I get to the next step? How do I get to the next step? How do I get to the next step? Rather than, you know, either shutting down or just thinking, well, now I can't get the 400 units, you know, like uh, Mr. uh, Sterling did uh, on this week's podcast. So, yeah, crazy. Okay, David, what would you say in that same kind of situation? Well, you're going to make those mistakes. So first off, if you beat yourself up because you go over budget and you think that means you're not good at this, that doesn't help you at all. It doesn't serve mm-hmm. your purposes. So that's the first thing I'd say is like it, you should go in expecting to make mistakes so that you don't beat yourself up. You shouldn't be making that same mistake three, four, five, six times in a row. Then right. you might be, well, should I really be a real estate investor? Because obviously there's something about you that is not adapting to the circumstances, right? The second thing I would say is if you do go over budget, which is going to happen, don't Don't assume, like Brandon was saying, that you have to jump in there and make up the difference yourself. If you're a skilled laborer and you know this stuff really good and you don't really have any other options as far as making money, well, then, yeah, that's a great decision for you, right? But let's say you're me when I'm working as a police officer and I know I could just go stack up overtime Mm -hmm. and I can get time and a half money, right? 
I might actually lose money taking my time out of being right. a, a police officer and going onto the job. And everyone's different, which is why we can't answer this question yep. the same for every person, yeah. right? Because my opportunities might not be the same as yours. You might be an insurance salesman who's super talented and you could go make 50 grand in a month because mm -hmm. you really applied yourself and you would have saving 30 grand over two months was actually a bad call. Or you might be someone without those options. And so, yeah, you got to go get your hands dirty. But look at it from that perspective. What's the best use of my time? And if you buy a deal, and you go over budget and you lose money on it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a loss, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think I think I use Brandon's example all the time. The first house you flipped, it was, was it your first one, Brandon? That weird one that you never should have flipped. It was like very unusual, really big. Yeah, yeah it was like my triplex, third. You know, yeah, exactly. That was like my third, <laughs> my third flip, okay. basically. So, yeah. so you lost money on that deal, but what you learned on it enabled you to make money on your next 10, right? Yeah. And if you made just 10 grand over the next 10 deals that what you learned in that deal made you a hundred thousand dollars. So that's a win still. And right. you just have to kind of take that overall perspective. And I think the other big thing too, my business partner and I were actually just talking about this the other day on the phone, because this is only the first example of many like it that we've actually had in, in our investing. And, and it goes back to the Annie Duke podcast where she talks about, you know, the, you know, you, there's such a thing as making the right decision and just getting unlucky on the outcome versus, you know, taking a gamble and getting lucky and which one's actually better. And so, you know, it's also that kind of a situation, you know, did you analyze it right? Did you make the right decision going in and you just had an unlucky set of circumstances and then how do you learn from that? So I think that's the other big takeaway, you know, that, that I'm trying to go through even in, in our current state that we're at. That's really good. You mentioned a minute ago, James, that uh, the deal you were buying, there was no money involved, but that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have any money. Can you maybe yeah. break down a little bit what the dichotomy is between no money investing and actually being broke? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the difference, right, with no money is you're trying to leverage, uh, you know, your, your time and your skills in order to kind of be able to get more deals. But you have to be able to recognize that there's you know, other things that are unanticipated that can come up. And if you have no way to react and respond to those, that's when you kind of start getting, you know, into challenging situations. So we had one property that it ended up sitting vacant for a year and we actually had to pay off the investor because the note came due. Right. So it's like that wasn't something that we were anticipating and you have to kind of but, you know, it could happen. So as you're looking to evaluate deals and analyze deals, how far do you stretch? How much risk are you willing to take? And a lot of times it's, you know, just that balance of, OK, yeah, we don't have any money into this, but what are the potential things that can happen and how do you make sure you do it in a reasonable and responsible way? Yeah, I love that. You know, I make that point several times throughout that, you know, the very first book I wrote, the book on investing in real estate with no low money down is that investing with no and low money down is not about having no money. Mm -hmm. Like most of the best investors I know don't use their own money when they put together a deal. Oftentimes they use mm -hmm. none of their own money, right? Even the rehab stuff, but it doesn't mean they don't have money. Right. So James, do you have a recommendation? I mean, a rule of thumb that you follow on how much should somebody have in reserves when they buy a real estate, like call it a rental property. I know there's yeah. a lot of no. debate there. No, yeah, and I think, again, it depends on what you wanna say. So if you asked me this question six months ago, it would have been a totally different answer because I thought we had way, uh, we had plenty in reserves. And basically what ended up happening is we were going through a refi. It came in 25% lower than what we were expecting. Then wow. we went into a flip where we ended up deciding to use uh, bank financing. So like, uh, you know, conventional or uh, traditional, construction loan. So we had to bring, you know, some money to the table as part of that. And then on this flip, our original budget was 120, which the bank was financing on the renovations. We're at 160 now. So it's like, not only did I get hosed on my refi going right into this flip, but now coming out of that, I've got these. And then I had two rental properties go vacant, one of which was vandalized all throughout this process. So where I thought I had plenty of reserves, Again, just series of, you know, the one thing after the next, after the next has been piling up. So I would say, you know, when you're looking to scale, you know, especially if you want to scale quickly, um, you probably need to have reserves available significantly larger than what you're, what you think you really need. You know, if the bank tells you, you only need five grand in the bank or something like that, uh, you know, what happens when you do have to go in and replace a whole bunch of stuff? Cause that could happen. Yeah. So James, I, let's. Let's take a step back here. Can you give us kind of an overall view of what you're investing in, how many yep. units you have, what your strategy is, and then we'll kind of break it down from there? Sure. So right now I have 15 uh, properties and then the flip that we have ongoing, we just got it listed. Um, so right now, so the breakdown is basically five of those were kind of the Burr uh, strategy. 
Uh, seven are turnkey that we bought from other investors that were selling off their portfolio. Uh, we have one that we did a commercial lease back on. Um, and then uh, the day after Christmas, we're closing on, we're, we're under contract to close on five more properties, including our first mixed use uh, and our first duplex. So that'll add eight more units uh, before the end of the year to get me up to 23. That's awesome. Okay. So I want to I want to dive into those in a minute. But first of all, uh, I'm wondering how are you finding these deals? I mean, like they're they're kind of a variety. You've done a number of different things. You got yeah. you got the commercial lease back. You got the mixed use. You got like, what are you doing to find these deals? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the majority of them have actually come through. I have. Uh, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think one of the best agents out there, uh, definitely, at least in my market. Um, and, you know, so he's actually got a really interesting story. So he started out as a commercial appraiser uh, and then uh, became a residential agent and then got rid of his commercial appraisal license and then became a commercial broker. So he has a lot of connections, you know, with the overall investor community in, in the Wilmington area. And almost all the deals we've done have kind of been, you know, off market pocket listings and things like that, that he's had other investors and other people bring to him. And he knows kind of my style. And so he brings it to me and he says, can you do this? And I go, yeah. And so that's how we've gotten a lot of them. Uh, we've done like one with a wholesaler. I think one was off the MLS. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's a little bit, I, I, one of the things we talk about at the time is we don't really truly have like a funnel where, you know, we're doing marketing and all these different kinds of things. And we have some things we're looking at when we eventually stabilize our business for how do we kind of bring in that funnel and that that stable pipeline. But our growth has been, I call somewhat organic in that we've just been taking the deals as they come to us. Well, you do have a funnel but you're not the one who put the funnel together. Like what you did was hijack that realtor's funnel or your broker's yeah. <laughs> funnel, right? And just plugged yourself right in, which is even better than having your own funnel if you really mm -hmm. think about it. And if you get two, three, four people with their own funnels and you're just jumping in at the very end of it when the deals come your way, well, that's your funnel that you kind of made. And I'll let Brandon jump in here because he's the funnel master. Like yep. that should that should be we should come up with some nickname for him, like hashtag <laughs> funnel, funnel master. master. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he has to walk around always like looking through like a, a yep. measuring funnel. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I got nothing. No, I will say this. As I, I, I say this all the time, and I'll say it again here, that every real estate investor in the world has the same funnel. We all have the exact same funnel. You get leads. You analyze them somehow, and people have different ways of doing it. They have different ways to get leads. You, so you get leads. You analyze them. You pursue them. So LAP, and then sometimes you get success, which is the S, right? So LAPS. Everyone follows that. So your funnel, uh, you might have numerous ways of getting leads. It sounds like you got a variety of ways, but it's a lot of it's centered around that, that broker who's helping you get it. Like David said, you just totally uh, hijacked that, which is awesome. Uh, and, uh, and then you run the numbers, I'm assuming. You figure out w whether it's worth to do it. You go after some of them, and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Like, how often do, do you get rejected when you make offers? Like, or, or are you pretty successful and you only go after the ones that you're sure you're going to get? I, would say, I mean, we're, we're generally pretty successful, actually. So, you know, again, it's one of those uh, we've been working with my broker now for three years. So he understands our business model and how we do things. So it's really like he'll bring it to me when he knows that there's going to be a fit and when the particular seller is in that right position. Right. Um, you know, to, to sell on our terms. So where we've had stuff fall out, we had one we were under contract on earlier this year for five properties, but the seller hadn't seen the properties in five years. And like there was a squatter in one and all kinds of stuff. So like we were originally under contract. We went back and asked for one hundred and fifty thousand dollar price adjustment, you know, on the portfolio. And they were like, we can't sell that cheap and it's like go look at your properties like you either need to put the money in or you're going to take that price hit and they're just not ready yet and you know when the time comes and they are hopefully you know we'll be able to step in and you know our offer still good to buy those but you know that's when we seem to see you know things that you know where the investor isn't really necessarily in tune with what they want to do um because we don't try and lowball people and get things cheap right i mean we just you know here's how our numbers work and and that's what the offer is and you know we we usually make it work yeah i love that how how non-emotional that is, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, real estate is kind of an emotional thing. We get involved, but the more you can stick to your numbers of, the, you know, this is just what it says. And hey, we, you know, yeah. we found something in inspection. Now our number's this. It's just, right. it is what it is. This isn't an emotional mm -hmm. game, right? And so yeah. many, especially new investors, just get so, and I get it, but they get so involved with it because they just yeah. want a deal and, yep. and, and they get emotion. So anyway, yeah, I think that's, I think that's huge. So, okay, so let's move on. Like, so you got, you got these properties. There's some, mm -hmm. you know, residential in there. The commercial. Well, you said lease. Uh, the commercial lease back. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So it was actually pretty interesting. So this this particular deal was. Uh, they own their office building, and then they own four row homes behind it, uh, where it was. 
And the very first one connected to their office building, they had to expand. And so they actually converted it into office space. And so they were trying to market their office building with the other four units. Uh, but their office was, they were asking too much for it. It was too nice. We didn't need the space and things like that. Um, but we wanted the other four. And so basically as part of the negotiation, they're like, well, we're not, we haven't sold the other building. We need to stay there. So they signed a two-year lease to stay in the unit. So, you know, immediately upon closing it, you know, we we basically signed a lease as part of the closing documents. And, you know, on at the closing table, I got my security deposit and every month, you know, there's a check in the mail. So that's awesome. So, can yeah. you tell me, James, like the, the you said you're getting most of these deals from a broker. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what does your average deal look like? And then from there, we'll break down like how you're funding it, mm -hmm. how you're finding it, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the average deal, uh, again, we've actually been getting like kind of a little bit bigger with each transaction. Um, but what we do right now is, is uh, you know, they're basically our, our, our average deal, you know, has like an ARV of somewhere between 85 and 115. Okay. Um, and so we're our basically our criteria is what my bank's criteria are, which is I need to pick it up for about 70% of the ARV because I I'm, I'm can refinance up to 75%, but I've obviously got some holding costs and things like that that are packed in there. And then I got to be able to have a debt coverage of one, two to one, two, five. And so, you know, that's basically my criteria. It's like, hey, if they're offering it in a place where we think we can negotiate to there, then we're generally pretty good. Um, and then as far as how we're doing it, because they're all individual single families, when we bring our investors in, uh, it's just a straight, you know, uh, single mortgage and note with that private investor. There's no syndication or anything along those lines involved with, with how we're structuring the financing piece. Before we dig in, can you explain what the debt coverage ratio is that you just described for people who don't know? Yeah. So basically there's the, the net operating income on the property, which basically says here are your uh, income you know, from the property. Here's all of your projected expenses. Now I've learned banks calculate it differently than the way I would calculate it. So it's hard sometimes to know exactly what they're putting in there, but you basically get to your net operating income. And then once they figure out what your debt obligation would be based on the rate and term and things along those lines, as long as your cash flow is coming in is 20 to 25% greater than that debt payment, uh, then they would consider that you have enough cushion in there to generate your reserves and, and cash flow uh, to, to support the property. Nice. So a debt, yeah. a debt service coverage ratio, also called DSCR of 1.2, mm -hmm. would mean that you're generating 120% of what it costs to run the property, basically, right? And yep. that's a metric that banks look at because they want to know that you're going to have enough cash flow to pay them back. So very good exactly. point. Thank you for sharing that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And if people have questions about things like that, if you could, I just want to actually call this out here. If you're listening to this show right now, if you're listening, you're driving, whatever, like if there's terms like that, you don't know. I mean, we're going to try to explain them on the show and we do try to pull those out, but oftentimes we just don't, or we don't think about it or whatever, but there's this amazing website out there called biggerpockets.com and it's totally free to go there True. and search for like DSCR or whatever. Right. And like, there's a little magnifying glass and navigation bar jump in there, search for the terms there, and they're right there. You can also go to the show notes anytime, like, you know, if we're doing a show, uh, like biggerpockets.com slash show 312. You can go to the show notes, and then right there, you can, you know, we'll, we'll put links to articles about it. We, we kind of throw in those things as well. So, again, don't, like, just go, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm going to turn, you know, turn off my brain. Like, use that as an opportunity to grow. So, moving on. Uh, I want to go back. Actually, I should say moving on, but moving back. We're going back to the future. Uh, am I right in assuming that you're basically burying these? Like you're buying them with private money, these single-family houses, and then refinancing them later? Is that is that your strategy? Yeah, exactly. So again, some of them, you know, have you know they're they're vacant and they have work that needs to be done. So it's what I call really the the true burr. But we're we're kind of doing the same thing, even with what I would call these turnkey properties. So when I say turnkey, I'm not we're not buying them from a turnkey company or something like that. But we're buying them with tenants already in place. And my commercial lender doesn't have a seasoning requirement and they view the private loan as if it were a cash transaction. And so we can buy it cash, cash with our private lender's money. And then as soon as the deed is recorded, I can start the refinance process with them and, and cash our investors out if we need to. Can you tell us how you found a lender that would do something like that? I called uh, probably 40 or so different lenders. I've got, you know, we, uh, I, I've been slowly building out a, a Podio database of all these different, you know, insurance lenders mm -hmm. or private lenders, the properties, building all kinds of different stuff. I'm a technology spreadsheet nerd um, and, and really just kind of, you know, every single credit union, local bank, uh, any basically anybody I could find that seemed like they had commercial lending. And I said, this is what I want. This is what I need. Can you do it? And the majority of them said, no, you can't get that. And I was like, yes, you can. I'm going to find it. And I just kept on calling. 
calling and calling and calling yeah. uh, until I found them. <laughs> so, so you put together a system of systemizing different lenders in a CRM. Mm -hmm. Brandon, can we think of a name for what he's doing here? How it, he's taking a whole bunch of things and he's narrowing it down to get the answer he wants. <laughs> what would we call that? I'll let, I'll let you come up with it. <laughs> I suppose it'd be a form of a funnel, right? But see, that's the answer, right? That's that's why I want to jump, jump in with this because it's very often in any business endeavor or any life endeavor that you want a result that you can't get. And then you get frustration, right? Frustration is interference with the desired goal. And oftentimes we let frustration cause us to quit. Well, this was harder than I thought or it didn't come as easy as I thought. I can't find the lender that James has. It must be easy to be James. He's got this lender yeah, that will yeah. let him look at this, this transaction like it's cash, right? But you had to work to find that lender. You had to find 40 different people and call all of them, right? You turned your frustration into a plan. You took action on that plan. You broke it down. You found the lender. Now it's kind of easy for you. You only had to do that one time, and you can keep mm -hmm. going back to that same well over and over. And that's really the secret to what makes somebody successful with this and doesn't is this is a puzzle. You got to put together all these little pieces to make it work. And everyone's puzzle is different. So we can't yeah. give you the same answer to every person, but we can give you the same techniques that everybody uses to solve their puzzle. And Brandon is really, really good at articulating this and explaining it. If you guys aren't on the bigger pockets webinars, you need to jump on there. Cause like every week he's going through different puzzles and how he solves them using these principles that we talk about. And I just want to encourage people when you get stuck and you're frustrated, put together the system, the funnel, get your answer. And then you're like, well, this is easy because you've done this several times, James, you've got one mm -hmm. funnel that led to finding the lender. You've got another funnel that led to finding private money. So now you have people to fund these deals and you have a funnel where your broker you've tapped into his and he's sending you deals. Those three things make your job easy. Now the deals just come to you, you fund them, you refinance them, you're good. Yeah, except the funnel I got to figure out next is tenants because we've had a lot of vacancy problems. So that's yeah. uh, as we've talked about systematizing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the big focus going into next year is is the the tenant funnel, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's important. I mean, like, and, and it it is a funnel, right? Like you yeah. you have leads, you get as many leads <laughs> as possible of potential people. You uh, we had a guy on the show years ago. Maybe it wasn't a guy. I mean, maybe it wasn't a, the show. Maybe it was a blog post. I can't remember who it was. Anyway, he what's that term like the World War One, the Blitzkrieg? Is that how you say it? Yeah, right. Blitzkrieg. He called it the Blitzkrieg strategy for getting tenants, and it was basically like uh, they go out there and they post in like thirty different places, and they put signs and yards yeah. and blah blah blah, right? Like, and the whole idea was get them in the funnel. Then you're going to analyze yeah. the tenant. And you're going to yeah. pursue some of them, and some of them are going to be successful, right? So it's all about getting more and more leads, largely, and finding mm -hmm. ways to you know handle that. Anyway, my wife is like a pro at figuring that out so uh anyway if uh you know you got it you understand it you get there so <laughs> well you, let's let's I, talk about why you're having tenant problems okay uh yeah. most of the tenants that are coming in you're probably inheriting them with the properties that you buy because you're getting it from a broker and he's getting it from someone who already owns it right so you're mm -hmm. pinching off this great deal before it goes to the market which is why you can find it however it comes with an inherent difficulty right yeah yeah, so uh, so some of the problems have been uh, from inherited ones, but a lot of them have also been from people that have been uh, placed into them. So uh, again, this kind of goes back to the the Annie Duke of kind of like what are we doing wrong in in this process? Um, you know, so as we're looking at you know tenants that are in place, one of the things that we learned twice now we've gone and we've purchased uh, properties and had tenants move out the month we bought the property. And so the first one, they claim that they gave their notice and all this kind of stuff, but nobody could find the paperwork and blah, blah, blah. Yep. And then the second one, it was actually a Section 8 tenant lost their voucher the month. And, and it, like the mailing went out from the housing authority the week we had closing. So I immediately had to start, you know, the five day letter and the eviction process for that. So you bring up an interesting point here, and, and I know this wasn't where we were, we were going, but I want to stress this. People often look at Section 8, and I hear it, guaranteed income from the government, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> but I've had, I've had several Section 8 tenants lose their voucher. And you're, you're, you ask yourself, why would a tenant do something to screw up getting free money? Yeah, and that, I, I don't but understand it. <laughs> they do, right? Like I had one yeah. tenant who they had to have an inspection once a year. She would not let the inspectors in because she assumed that there were government agents coming to attack her. And so she <laughs> lost her voucher. And like the, all of a sudden now you have a tenant who just has zero chance of pain. So anyway, I'm not saying don't do Section 8. I actually kind of like Section 8, but they are, it's not free guaranteed money. 
and it's funny because my my contractor likes to say I define all of the odds and everything that he knows to be true with it. He's been investing <laughs> himself for 15 years and in the construction business because every one of my projects has way more problems than he's ever seen. And then he's also going to the point his only evictions have ever been on non Section 8 tenants. So he's like trying to move all of his properties to giant gearing more towards Section 8. And I'm like, I've had bad experiences both ways i was like so i just need to figure out how to get better people in regardless of what their circumstances are and, and that's that's what we're trying to you know figure out how do we do that better job screening and i'm actually just started rereading the book on managing rental properties oh, just nice. because i'm like i remember so many good nuggets in there i'm like i need to go back and revisit and start actually like figuring out how we put these into a system and, and utilize them yeah property management really is and thank you for that plug by the way uh but property <laughs> management really is a system you know like it's a yeah. it's a it's, thing it's it's a business and it's hard. Uh, yeah, there are a crazy. lot. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff. So, you know, I, you know, if you want to learn that system, then great. Learn that system. Otherwise, you need to find a property manager who is a rock star who knows that system. Right. Uh, yeah. Like David has a property manager that manages like he has multiple ones. Right. I mostly mm -hmm. do it in house. But the only reason I do it in house is because we were willing to take the pain needed to learn how to do that where yep. David was probably smarter and was just like, I'm just going to, you know, I'll outsource it from the beginning. So, or lazy. I mean, that's, that's, that's <laughs> usually what I hear you say about David though, that, that he's smarter. Yeah. So. Exactly. That sounds and, better than lazy. And better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say I'm better looking and more Brandon, talented. Brandon's and, the know. guy that will spend three hours to put together an Ikea chair while we're in Hawaii and like, he could be watching a sunset and he's like, but I saved $17 by doing it myself. That's pretty yeah. much it. And I, it's yeah, it's also why he grows his beard longer, right? You know, he don't does. have to trim it as often. Exactly. <laughs> the, the more you work, the you know, the more good you feel about yourself. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm such a positive guy. All right. Uh, All right. So moving on. You got something, David? No, I was going to move on too. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest one, one thing that I do when I buy a property that I inherit a tenant. I assume, like, I put it in my numbers that I'm going to have to evict that tenant and have a vacancy for three months. Like I almost always, now on like an apartment complex, I don't do that because I don't assume I'm going to lose all of them, but I assume I'm going to lose a few of them and probably a larger percentage than I would normally, right? Because I just know that in transition, those things happen. Uh, mm -hmm. There was this great uh, Instagram discussion the other day. There's a, a, a who was it that did it? Um, Ramit Sethi, who was a he was a yeah. author. He wrote a book called "I Can Teach You to Be Rich," I think. Anyway, mm -hmm. he's like super anti real estate, but anyway, he <laughs> has this discussion on there about uh, getting tickets while driving. He said getting a speeding ticket is not an unexpected expense. Yes, it comes at unexpected times, but getting a speeding ticket is an expected thing that you will go through. Now, all these people were like, "Maybe you just shouldn't speed," but his point was, like. There are a ton of things that just go wrong, right? So mm -hmm. if you just plan for that in your budget, and I think the same thing applies to real estate in this way. Like, and again, we're all learning this stuff all the time, and I'm I'm kicking myself. I'm doing some stuff like I mean, uh, rehabbing right now for the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. they're not unexpected; they just come yeah. at unexpected times, right? So like right. things like evictions, like they are going to happen. So you yeah. just plan for them. That's why we, in the calculators that we have in bigger pockets, we have a spot for vacancy, a spot for capex, a spot for repairs, a spot for all that stuff because. Yeah, they don't happen every month. You can't plan on them, but they do happen. And so you have yeah. to plan for them and budget for them. And that's, but the thing too, right, is, is you talk about the plan and budget for them, but on that note, right? So, you know, if you go on the forums, everybody talks about, you know, your standard, you know, percentages and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, we use a lot of those standards. It was like, yeah. hey, our budget was going to be 10% vacancy, right? Well, yeah. I'm running a 30% vacancy this year between mm -hmm. non-paying tenants, trying to get them to eviction and then how vacancies replacing people. Yep. And then we're using a 20%, you know, CapEx slash repair number. And we know that when we walk these properties, they obviously had some deferred things that we knew we we're going to have to do, but we assumed we would have you know, two or three or four years to accumulate cash flow to be able to, you know, do that. Well, I'm running this year, I think it's going to be, end up being like a 60% expense ratio because where I was, you know, not expense ratio, just on the rehab part of it, yeah. just because again, we had the, we had four units turn over, you know, that needed, you know, pretty significant work done. And again, it wasn't that we weren't budgeting for it, yep. but this again goes back to the, you know, investing with no money. Again, if I had put all my money into all of this stuff, we'd be in a really, really tight spot right now. <clears throat> Yep. Sorry. Um, you know, with having to go and do, you know, all of these repairs that we need to have done. I love that you say that. I love that you're honest about that. Cause I mean, that, that is the truth, right? Like I've felt the same thing. Like a lot of times I, my projections of properties are a whole lot better than what they actually are, especially the first year or two, like, mm -hmm. because there's always those things. Um, yeah. and that's why, again, it's okay to invest using other people's money, but you should not do it broke. 
because uh, yeah. you're in trouble. Now, that doesn't mean if you have no money, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Just find a partner who has the exactly. money, the resources to be able to mm-hmm. back up those things, right? Yeah. Like if you're like, well, I'm going to go down to the wire here. I'm gonna, you know, if this goes wrong, I'm not going to have money for dinner. <laughs> find a partner yeah. who can give you dinner. You know what I mean? Like, so. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. All right. So. Uh, very cool. So I want, I want to shift, but I want to talk one more thing before we get onto the deep dive. And that is working a full-time job. Cause you do that. Yeah, do you have I any do. tips or suggestions for those who are listening to the show that are like, I really want to, you know, invest in real estate. I want to do exactly what James mm-hmm. is doing, but I'm working full-time. Any suggestions? Yeah. So it, there's, there's all the awesome exceptions of people that, you know, come on the podcast and they grow crazy fast and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's a matter of, you know, being honest with kind of what your circumstances and your situation are, right? So again, you know, like we've talked about these systems and processes and funnels and all that sort of stuff. When I bought my first deal off the Bigger Pockets marketplace back in February of 2016, I didn't have any of that in place. So the problem is I think a lot of times people kind of like they see that end goal and they're like, oh, I got it. I got to get there. I got to do this thing. And they don't take the time to kind of realize, you know, what steps it takes and kind of do it one at a time, step by step. And you'll grow and you'll learn all of that stuff as you go. And so, again, one of the things that we learned this past year was we thought we could really start growing. So we again, by the time we close on these ones after Christmas, we'll have acquired 11 of our 23 units you know, just in the last six months. Wow. But one of the things that we learned was, again, with all these unexpected expenses and all that sort of stuff, we were like, hey, that's maybe too fast for where we need to be right now. And so we're actually, again, we're intentionally putting the brakes on, you know, going into the first part of 2019 to kind of level set and say, hey, we need to be in this for the long haul. We can't be short sighted and just grow at any expense because, you know, you can't keep bleeding money and expect that, you know, you're going to be able to be okay. So we need to be able to learn from that, figure it out, okay, how do we maintain where we are? And so, Again, thinking that you can go from zero to where I am now, I think is where people kind of get stuck and caught up and you just kind of have to take it one step at a time, one deal at a time, and you will just naturally start to gain that momentum and grow, you know, to a point where you're comfortable. And then you'll be like, why did I think this was hard before? And it just starts to become easier. Momentum. That is like the perfect word to describe. That's what it is. It's like moving a train, right? It takes all the energy Mm -hmm. or getting a spaceship launched off. Look at me. Brandon analogy Turner today. All right. So, uh, anyway, I love, I love your story. I love that stuff. Uh, where are you headed? I know you say you're slowing down a little bit. Where do you see your next Mm -hmm. five, 10 years being? Yeah. So, uh, a lot of different things. So we, we liked kind of the model we're doing. So we definitely view our uh, investing as a business. So I'd say like, there's also a difference there. So, you know, like, are you investing and you want it to be passive and that sort of a thing, or do you view it as a scaling a business? So we do see that. And so we see a lot of opportunities kind of in, uh, ancillary, you know, kind of parts where, you know, as you scale vertically, um, make some, you know, expand some horizontally. And then for us too, it's also identifying some additional markets where we can kind of copy, I don't want to say franchise because we would still run it, but, you know, being able to diversify into other types of markets. We view Wilmington, again, it was a market that was nearby. It was convenient. The cash flow worked, but the appreciation isn't really there in some of our neighborhoods. Um, so we've identified maybe some markets that have some better appreciation opportunities, even though they may not cash flow as well. But then there's also some up and coming you know, cities where and neighborhoods that we think have some, you know, really good cash flows now, but also opportunity. So it's kind of looking at, you know, how do we kind of start diversifying our portfolio in that regard? And then on the investor side, you know, we've also talked about, you know, do you start to look at, you know, syndication? Uh, and we like kind of the debt fund option versus, you know, an equity option. Uh, and some of the things along those lines is kind of as you scale, how do you maintain flexibility? And uh, again, a lot there. And part of what we have to realize, again, how specific in general do we want to be versus how much do we want to generalize? And some of that will be how things evolve, obviously, over the next six months and then a year. And we constantly have an annual strategy meeting where we're doing that five year plan. And for the last three years, it's changed every single time we sit down and do that based on what we've learned and, and what we decide we want to do yeah that makes sense and when you say like you'd rather do the debt funding versus like a equity you're basically saying you'd rather pay interest on it rather than splitting the profits as like a partnership exactly yeah so for us it's just the way that our our business model makes sense you know so we need to have a large enough cash flow pool basically coming in rather than you know paying out uh on the equity side makes makes sense to me all mm-hmm. right. Well, let's let's shift gears now and head over to the next part of our show. Uh, one of my favorite things that we do in, the, in every episode is the deal deep dive. Deep dive. This is the part of the show where we dive deep, dive deep, dive deep, dive deep into one particular <laughs> deal with our guest. So, James, you got a deal in mind, right? 
Yes, I do. All right. So why don't we start? We're just going to do quick fire answer questions. Uh, yep. Number one, what kind of property is it? It's a money pit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, uh, I, so, I love that. This, All right. This, this, was, this was intended to be a burr. Okay. Uh, single okay. family row home. All right. All right. Number two. All right. right. How'd you find it? Uh, so this one was actually came to me. It was a wholesaler who reached out to a member on Bigger Pockets who doesn't invest in the city of Wilmington. A lot of local investors only invest in the county outside of it. Um, and he knew I invested in that area. And so he forwarded it to me and I reached out to the wholesaler. And um, funny story there was actually my contractor was doing a renovation on a property two houses down. And he had already been talking with the owner about buying it. And I basically had to go to my contractor and say, well, you either need to buy it now or I'm going to, because otherwise this wholesaler is going to go and sell it to somebody else. So yeah. it actually all kind of came together uh, pretty interestingly. Cool. All right. How much was it? So we ended up paying 27500 for that place. And how did you negotiate that price? Um, we ended up, we were already pretty close. So the seller was originally asking 30 and we offered 25 Um and we basically came back to him and we kind of showed him our scope of work and things that we thought we were going to do on the house. And, uh, you know, from there, he basically said, you know, yeah, I get it, but I need to be able to get some, you know, more out of it. And so he was like, I'll, I'll meet you in the middle. So. All right. Uh, how did you fund it? Uh, so we, again, used a private lender on the acquisition and uh, the projected rehab numbers. All right. Do you remember uh, you say projected? So we'll get to that. Uh, so did you have a projection on how much you were going to put into it? Uh, I did. So we had originally projected that we were going to spend twenty nine thousand uh, on the rehab and we ended up spending thirty eight thousand. OK. Um, and then um, that was just on what the original rehab part. And then after we did that, this is actually the property that then sat vacant for nine more months. And we had to cash out our investor before uh, we were able to refinance it. And then after the tenant moved in, we had an additional $15,000 in expenses and repairs that we had on top of that. So all in, what is that, 38 plus another 15, so like 53,000 we ended up having to put into it. I did Ooh. my math quickly right there. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask what, what, what went wrong? What was a 15? Like what, um, what happened? <laughs> yeah, so it was... Uh, the roof started to uh, give way and have leaks that we couldn't find. So we had to do multiple repairs to the roof. Um, the furnace ended up going out like in the middle of the winter um, that we had to replace. We knew it was older, but it had serviced fine. Like we didn't think we we're going to have issues that quickly with it. Um, then there was uh, an old cast iron drain pipe uh, on the one uh, tub that like gave out and started leaking water that we had to then go replace the plumbing and do drywall and paint work and stuff like that. Um, we originally were planning to put the washer and dryer into the basement, but in Wilmington, they have a lot of narrow basements. So you have to get these smaller 24 inch washer and dryers a lot of times, but we couldn't even get that to fit. So then we had to actually build a laundry cabinet off of the, uh, the living room. So we had that additional expense of having to build that out and run electrical and things that we weren't expecting. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was some of the extra stuff on the front side. It was the, uh, the kitchen floor had actually buckled in. So we had to rip all of it out and redo all of the, the joists and everything actually underneath it. Whereas we thought we were just putting tile in, um, initially the, uh, electrical panel we knew had to be upgraded because it was an old fuse box. But, uh, when we went and redid it, they couldn't even put it where it was. They actually had to reroute it because it was too close to the water line to be uh -huh. current code. So it wasn't even just a swap out. We actually had to move it. So it was just all these kind of things that, you know, older houses have very different things. Most of my properties are built between the 1880s and 1930s. So that's another thing. When you hear a lot of these people on the bigger pockets, they talk about these standard expenses and how they do things. Um, a lot of that is, again, on these post 1950s, 60s homes. I know, Brandon, a lot of your places up in Washington are older houses. Yes. So you probably understand some of this stuff that they have their own different types of challenges. As soon as you go away, like they're fine as long as you don't touch them. But as soon as you touch them, you have to bring them up to code. So yep. um, interesting challenges there. Yeah, older so houses. You, sorry, as I say, older houses definitely do have more expenses. You got to plan on that. Yeah, yeah. Once we, you we had started it, to learn that. <laughs> once you had it all fixed up and the rehab was finally done, what'd you end up doing with it? Uh, so we finally got a tenant in. Uh, she's paying ten fifty a month right now. Those are okay. those are good numbers. I mean, like even even with all of that in there, even though mm -hmm. all that sucks, you're still, uh, you know, it, it's almost a two percent deal even after all of that. 
Yeah, it ended up appraising for less too. So that was the other part that then sucked. Not only do we put all this extra money into it, sure. but where we thought it was going to appraise for about 95 or 100, it only ended up appraising for 85. And while it doesn't feel like it's a whole lot, like, you know, when, when you kind of want to be able to pull out everything you can when you know you've already put more into it. So kind of getting hit on the refi side kind of wasn't a lot of fun either. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But, you know, like, again, hopefully this thing now, hopefully, again, hopefully you've taken care of a lot of that CapEx that would have been spread over the next 10 years. You've mm -hmm. just front loaded a lot of that, which, again, sucks in the beginning. Yep. Right. We're hoping. And, that, yeah. and now we just got to hope the tenant gets uh, current on her rents before we have to evict her in January. Yes. That so would help. we've got that going, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, this is the money pit. So yeah. it's it's been entertaining. Yeah. Uh, not in a fun way. Like I said earlier, real estate is very forgiving. It sucks that you're doing this. You're going to learn a ton of lessons. That's yeah. just the last question. Like, what lessons did you learn from this deal? Yeah. I mean, this is the one that really taught us, you know, that the numbers don't always make sense the way that you thought they're going to. Right. And so. Uh, it was really at that point that we started uh, again, we've got, you know, our Excel spreadsheet models and stuff like that, that we do all these things with. Yep. And, uh, you know, we're constantly retuning those and refining those. So it was like, hey, we need to tweak what we think these expenses are going to mm -hmm. be and how we're going to project this. And, um, you know, even after that one, we've still made more changes to it. I think it's on like version five or six of how we've designed all the, the things and stuff like that at this point. But, uh, you know, that was really the first time where it was like, oh, hey. And you'd think we had learned, you know, several times and we felt like we had, but it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. That's, so, <laughs> you know, there, there's a, there's a famous quote that Mike Tyson said, he said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I really like that yeah. quote a lot, right? Like you can plan really, really well. That sounds that, about yeah, right. That at some point you just, you're in the fight and you get punched in the, and then your plan goes out the window sometimes and it sucks. Yep. But yeah, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So, Sounds right. well, there's there's something to be said for that because if you really believe it and you buy into that, you you quit trying to figure everything out before you get in the fight, and instead you start training for what you're gonna do when you get punched in the mouth. Yep. Like you start trying to develop a mindset of okay, when I'm punched in the mouth, how am I gonna repeat this action over and over and over so that it's instinct instead of having a, oh my god, I don't like how this feels, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like controlling your own emotions in a deal, like oh god, that. The water leak just happened. This is going to be $12,000 and it feels like you just got punched in the mouth. Yeah. Are you going to respond to it in this way or in that way? And that's what successful people concentrate on. They don't try to plan out the whole fight before they get into it. Right. They, they practice what I'm going to do when A, B, or C happens. And then they have this confidence they can kind of flow. Yeah. And again, so one of the big things we're doing, right, is, is trying to, again, figure out how do we better project these things and change how we budget and different things along those lines. And, and so we're, we're constantly evolving. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things again, that, you know, we've learned not only from this deal, but all of the challenging ones is, you know, there's that constant need to every, you know, challenge everything, question everything and evolve every day. So final question for you in this segment of the show. Uh, I appreciate you picking out a deal that did not go well. Me that's too. really cool. I was just <laughs> say that. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. Uh, but even with everything going wrong, are you glad you bought it or do you wish you'd passed on it? Uh, I kind of wish my contractor had bought it, <laughs> but uh, we were actually talking about that the other day. But um, again, I think it's opened a lot. I mean, like, so the investor that we had on that, uh, again, he's still, you know, a really good friend. Uh, you know, we chat about deals all the time. Uh, you know, he still invests occasionally and things along those lines. So I think, again, going through those challenging experiences. So we've got you know, a, a pretty lengthy, detailed investment perspective that talks all about, you know, our market and what we do and how we do in our deals. And so, you know, we don't hide the challenges that we've had from our investors, right? I mean, they're very aware and clear on, you know, things haven't gone well and how we've reacted and recovered. And to a certain extent, I think that actually has helped us bring on more investors. Actually, we've had more interest in money than we've had deals available to keep that funnel balanced. And, you know, I think the fact that because every investor's concern is kind of like, well, you know, this all looks great on paper, but what are you going to do when things go sideways, right? Everybody's learned about how they're going to lose their money. And I think the fact that we've been through those experiences and we actually have case studies that we don't hide behind, um, that we can show how we handle those kinds of situations actually has benefited us in, in being able to look at the future and have a plan and the ability to grow and scale having been through those experiences. That's really good. I think people should just rewind the last like minute of this and listen to it again because it's so good. When you're honest, when you're transparent, like people can feel that. They can read that, and then they are more likely, I believe, to give you money or invest with you or bring you deals mm -hmm. or whatever when you can be transparent. So that yeah. was fantastic. So thank you, James, for sharing all that. That was really a really good deep dive. Again, people oftentimes are like, I mean, we love to share our wins and our, our awesome stories and brag about our great mm -hmm. stuff, but 
like in reality, like real estate's hard. You get punched in the mouth sometimes. And yep. uh, I really appreciate that. So, all right, moving on. Let's head over to the next segment, which we lovingly call our fire round. Fire. It's time for the fire round. <laughs> All right, let's get to the fire round. These are questions that come direct out of the Bigger Pockets forums. We're going to fire them right at you, James. You ready for this? Absolutely. All right, number one, uh, I'm looking to create a partnership. What's a fair deal when splitting profits? Yeah, I, I think so. When my partner and I did this, so my, my current business partner was one of my original private lenders on my first two deals. And so, you know, the kind of clear balance was I had some of the operational experience. By that point, I had uh, three rental properties under my belt. Um, you know, and so I'd gone through again, that first really terrible rehab where we went crazy over budget and all that sort of stuff and had the relationship with the contractors and he had the money. He's also not local. Uh, he lives, uh, out of state as well, further away than even I do. Um, so it's kind of a combination of like, okay, you know, you've got the money, you've got, you know, kind of some of the background. He also had, uh, kind of connections when we knew we were going to start raising money. He was kind of better suited given his background and, and, and things like that. And so I was like, Hey, you handle those sides and then I'll handle this. And so I think it's didn't necessarily have to be split that way, but it's being able to be clear on what do you bring to the table and then how do you leverage your skills as, as best as possible. And did you guys split things 50, 50 then on that, in, in that one? Yeah. So it was kind of what I want to call it an unequal capital contribution up front because, you know, but in the agreement, it was a 50, 50 split thereafter. So all the equity and, and cash flows and things along those lines are split. Um, even though, so a lot of people think like, oh, we have to contribute the same things, but it was known that, Hey, throughout this partnership, I'm going to probably put in more day-to-day -day responsibilities, interacting with the property managers and contractors and agents and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, he would have a little bit more of a back office. You know, we talk once a week, we review deals and finances. So, you know, that was kind of how we viewed, you know, money and time being split differently, but then all the profits and things like that 50 50. okay that sounds great next question i'm having trouble finding a broker to bring me deals can anyone tell me what i should be doing differently so on this one i would take a look at again what is the person's experience right so one of the things i love about my agent uh, and my broker you know again is he had that appraisal experience he is himself an investor um he you know, so, so again, he understood not just, I mean, there was, a, again, a forum post where somebody was like, you know, my agent won't do this or don't do, won't do that. And it's like, okay, drop the agent. Like not every agent is designed or geared to work with investors. Like we have a different way of looking at things. We have a different set of needs. And so I think being able to know that upfront, um, asking for referrals where you can, especially if you know, somebody's doing things different than you. So like my agent more than likely won't pick up somebody who's doing deals similar to me, because like I'm kind of the first person he comes to with those type of deal. But he has plenty of other investors he work with that either invest in different neighborhoods or have different criteria. And so being able to find where you have that ability to get that alignment as well, yeah. I think is pretty big. And you only know that by getting referrals or just interviewing enough people to say, how do you do this? How do you do that? This is what I'm looking for. Does that fit for your model? Um, and then you have to give it a trial run and see what happens. So it's kind of <laughs> like a funnel. All right, number three. It's crazy <laughs> how that keeps coming up, you know? <laughs> I know, crazy. Uh, <laughs> number three, I'm constantly running analyses on prospective properties. How do you say that? Analyses? 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 Yeah. Analyses? Analysis. I'm going to say analyses uh, on prospective properties. I know that there's several rules of thumb I've seen sprinkled around the forums. What are the most important rules of thumb you use? When analyzing properties, do you have any good rule of thumb? Um, good rules of thumb. Um, I would say location is the first thing that matters. So there's nothing that you can do, you know, to get by, you know, in, in a bad location. Um, you have to be comfortable. So like for me, those are actually the first two things when you're analyzing a deal. Like don't chase something that you're not comfortable with because um, that's when you're really going to start getting yourself into trouble. Yep. Yep. Once once you get past those, um, I would say um, Ben Leibovich has a really good post that he had done and, and he's linked to it a couple of times and I haven't found the permalink. So if we can dig it up and put it in there, but it's basically this like table that kind of covers like all of the top CapEx expenses, their average yeah, life expectancy yeah, yeah. and costs. And then it kind of basically says, okay, here's how much you need to save. Because I think the people thing that people get like bogged down by is they use like these percentages. But again, generally speaking, like a roof costs what a roof costs, kind of whether it's a $600 house or a $6,000 house. I mean, maybe a little bigger, but I mean, generally speaking, like those costs don't change a whole lot. Um, so being able to identify, okay, what makes sense for a rule of thumb? Like you got to understand like what I pay for property taxes in, in yeah. uh, Delaware isn't nearly what people who are analyzing a deal in New Jersey need to look at. Right. And so 
being able to know what rules of thumb you can use and can't use, I think is the important thing rather than just going on the forums and say, oh, well, everybody says use this for CapEx and use this for this number and this for that number, the 50% rule. Uh, I found that there's too much nuance to really kind of use those. All right. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Uh, I, you know what? One of my funny random, I, I, know, I know this isn't my interview today, but I'll say it. One of my random rule of thumb <laughs> when it comes to neighborhood, because you said that, a rule of thumb, this isn't like the 2% rule or anything like that. It's just a rule of thumb that I use. If I would feel comfortable with my wife jogging there at night, then I'll buy in that neighborhood. That's just like a simple rule of thumb. I always think that. I'm like, what, what, if Heather went jogging there in the afternoon, like late evening, like would I feel okay with her? And if not, then I'm like, I, won't, I don't want to buy there. And it's, it's like a... It's like a silly rule of thumb, but that's how I feel comfortable if, if, yep. if she'd be all right with it. So yep. anyway, people kind of come up with their own. So with that, let's move on to the final segment of the show. This is our Famous Four. Let's get to the Famous Four. Number one, what is your favorite real estate related book? So I had to sit and I had to think a lot about this one um, just because I, the, I think I don't know if I've read a whole lot of real estate books that weren't published by Bigger Pockets. Nice. So, <laughs> great um, answer, best answer I've ever heard. Moving on. I know. No. <laughs> I, they they are really good resources. So uh, again, I think it it tends to be you know where I'm at uh, in, in in certain things. So I already mentioned again Jay Scott's book on estimating rehab costs was huge for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's getting started. I'm I'm stoked to see the republish coming out here soon. Yep. Um, and then also again the book on managing rental properties. I mean. I know it, I don't mean to, you know, make Brandon Zigo get bigger, but between no, you and please Heather, do. did just an keep, amazing, keep it amazing job, you know, <laughs> just it's, it blows my mind. I think it should be mandatory reading for every, um, property manager to read that book because it blows my mind how clueless these people are. We're supposed to be professionals and representing how to do it. They have no idea. They think their job is just to collect money and mm -hmm. give it to me. And then everything else, it's like, well, I don't know what to do about that. And it's like, no, <laughs> like go read this book. You'll understand all of it. And uh, again, that's been huge. That's so here's an idea. Brandon, you come up with a test that someone has to pass and they have to read your book to be able to pass it. And then you give them the Brandon Turner certified property manager uh, designation. And then all the rest of us can know, oh, you're one of the BT certified PMs. I could definitely <laughs> use you. That's actually a great idea. Remove <laughs> all of the guesswork out of finding a good PM. Yeah. We've actually we've actually toyed with the idea of that on bigger pockets is maybe doing something like that. You know, we'll we'll see what the next year or so uh, has in store for that actually. But I, I really actually like that idea. Not like the Brandon Turner approval, but could we have you know bigger pockets <laughs> pocket certified approved. or something? Yeah. That could be very cool. So all right, that could be number two, David. What is your favorite business book? Uh, this one I think I'm gonna go with uh, Richest Man in Babylon by Ooh. George S. Clayson. Um, it's just so many really good nuggets. I think that kind of tie in, you know, just FI, you know, principles, investing, um, and just, you know, how to live life well. And, you know, when I kind of look at all these different niche books and stuff like that, yeah, they really dive in. But at the surface, I feel like, I mean, as old as that book was, uh, it really encapsulates just so many of the core basic fundamentals. Yep. You know what I like that why that book is so good. I mean, people mention the same similar books over and over on the show, right? People mention mm -hmm. Richest Man of Babylon, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, the um uh what's the one called? The uh, the E Myth, right? Mm -hmm. Uh even like lately I've had several people recommend in one of my favorite books, Life and Air. What these mm -hmm. books all have in common is they are stories. They're actually sort of like yeah. half fiction books, but you know, like they're stories that that teach us, right? Because humans, we learn mm -hmm. from story. Uh yeah. I just, I always find that so fascinating that the same books come up over and over and they're always this, almost always these stories. So mm -hmm. anyway, very cool. All right. Number three, number three, what are some of your hobbies? Um, so I like to board game a little bit. Nice. Uh, my board game shelf behind me. Uh, we actually are getting together with a group of bigger pockets people, I think in a couple of weeks and playing some board games. So that'll be cool. What's your favorite, um, favorite board game? Go. My favorite board game, Twilight Imperium three. <laughs> That is such yeah. a good answer. That was so specific too. Yeah, it <laughs> oh is. my god. So yeah, it's it's it is. Uh, sorry, it, it, it's one of those games I love getting to the table. Like if you've ever played Risk, it's like Risk yeah. on steroids. Um, so this game could take like six to ten hours to play, depending on how many people you have, and it's like this epic galactic battle of space races and politics, and uh, it's it's fantastic. Clearly superior to Twilight Imperium 2, but maintaining the same yeah. original nostalgia of Twilight yeah. Imperium, the original. And they just came out with Twilight Imperium 4 also. Oh, oh wow. Well, we have did you guys do a review, of, so. review of that. Have you guys ever seen Parks, uh, Parks and Rec, the show? 
Parks uh-huh. and Recreation. They actually came out with that board game. Did they really? Uh, like in yeah, yeah it, it was on Kickstarter. Somebody actually did a Kickstarter of the. Uh, <laughs> I forget what it. I forget the name of the game, but yeah, I, I he made this like a, just a huge absurd game, like yeah. board game in, the, in one of the seasons. Anyway, one of my um, favorite shows. Anyway, keep going. But the, the, no, I was say, the other thing is uh, uh, my daughter will turn two months old uh, in like a week and a half. So spending uh-huh. time with her and my wife has also become I mean, always spending time with my wife was always a priority. But having my uh, my daughter around now has been pretty awesome. So two, too. Mo- two months and old. She, so you're sleeping a ton right now. <laughs> no, dude, she sleeps like crazy. Like, it's oh, awesome. Great. Like, yeah. I mean, starting like Thanksgiving week, she started sleeping like six, eight hours a night. We just like, I like, I know I'm not supposed to knock on wood, but I'm knocking on the table because <laughs> like, I, I mean, it's, she's been fantastic. We're so lucky. Well, you're like, my, my daughter slept really well too until about three months and then it all, went, <laughs> oh, man, it all went downhill from right. there. Thanks, Brandon. Or I'm going to blame you if that yes. happens. Yes. Now. <laughs> Good luck. All right. What do you, for those, for those who can't see, if you're not watching this on YouTube, James literally has an entire background full of board games yeah, behind like his Like a hundred of them at least. Yeah. It's like legit, uh, like uh, I don't know what you would call this, like a nerd cornucopia going on <laughs> of board games back there. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll have to I'll, maybe I'll take a picture and put it on my uh, my my Instagram or you, you know what? I don't I don't see Monopoly see anywhere back there either. Uh, no, you won't see that. Oh man, that's my <laughs> game. That's my board game. All right, what do you think sets apart successful real estate investors from those who give up, they fail, or they never get started? Uh, so again, I was obviously thinking a little bit about this one and kind of came up with, with two pieces. So one for me was, you know, the fear of responsibility and a lack of honesty. And so kind of the fear of the responsibility is again, it's, you know, that, that taking action. And again, just everybody always hears about the, Oh, you know, when you're become a landlord, you're going to fix toilets at two o'clock in the morning. And, and so it's that like, how do I actually react and respond when things don't go well? And again, the lack of honesty is a lack of honesty with yourself, with your partners, again, about who you are, where you are, uh, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. Because again, I think the people that don't understand they're in a tough spot. Again, do I want to be putting the brakes on and not be buying more properties? Like, no, like I was like all gung ho, but wanted to like buy more, buy more. This is be awesome. We're, we'll just get past it. But again, it's just one of those like, okay, you know what? Uh, something's not right here. We got to figure it out. And just being able to take that step back instead of keeping the gas down. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, probably got in trouble, you know, in that, you know, back in 08, 09 and all that other fun stuff. Sure. And it's kind of one of those like, all right, we know we want to be in this for the long haul. So we got to be honest about where we are and what we need to do to make sure we are still doing this in two years, five years, 10 years, whatever. All right. That's a great answer. Thanks, James. That's very good advice. Tell us, where can people find out more about you? Uh, the Bigger Pockets forums are a great spot. Uh, if you're going to reach out and connect though, please leave a message. I always like knowing why people reach out. It kind of drives me crazy. They just want to connect and I never yeah. get like a message saying, Hey, here's what I, I think that's you're cool a great or tip. annoying or whatever. Um, and so always leave that message. Um, and then other than that, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and then I, I'm on Facebook, but I don't do a whole lot. Twitter casually there. Um, and then I just started up an Instagram. So I'm going to start trying to be a little more active on Instagram with pictures of our properties and what's going on and stuff like that. So what's your Instagram uh, handle? Uh, it's just James dot James Masadi thirteen thirteen or James dot Masadi thirteen thirteen. Uh, okay. uh, I sent it over to me again. I just started it like a week or so ago. It's I can well, send it over. We to will you guys. we will link to it in the show notes as well. BiggerPockets.com <laughs> yeah. slash show three twelve, and uh, we will link to it there. But uh, for those who don't know what you're talking about, when the, when you said you can find me on Bigger Pockets, people are like, wait a second, what what? Like this is a podcast, right? So Bigger Pockets is a social network. It's like Facebook, Twitter, less cat videos, less politics, more real estate, right? So you have a profile on Bigger Pockets. If you are listening to this and you're like, wait, I don't have a profile, guess what? It doesn't cost anything. It's free. Go set up your profile. Then you can send colleague requests to people and you become mm-hmm. colleagues, kind of like a friend, right? You can also follow people, kind of like on Twitter, you can follow. You can have private message conversations, which is huge, right? Yep. Uh, you can upload your, like in your profile now, you can put deals that you've done. Like there's a deal yep. diary section, upload your deals. Then people can see what you've done. All these things. This is part of the social network of bigger pockets. So if you are just a, um, uh, a, you know, a podcast listener, I would encourage you and implore you to join James and, uh, like tens of thousands of other people every day on the forums and in the social network. Yeah. And it's huge. I mean, I, I think it's also critically important to have your profile be updated. I mean, I have my deals in mind. I have an explanation of mine. I have the video in there because again, it's one, you know, when you start seeing and following people who are posting regularly on the forums and contributing, um, 
you know, you want to be able to kind of go out and find more out about them, you know, their market, how they do things. And, you know, there's a number of investors that I've reached out to and had fantastic conversations via private message. So like the forums are, you know, just like the, the, the tip of the iceberg, you know, when you get into the relationships that you build and being able to do private messages, there was, there was a, a, a post that got a, a thread that got a couple hundred follows a couple a while ago of like, where are all, are all the bigger pockets members and things like that. And there were so many of them from a lot of these guys that have, you know, 5,000 or more posts. And they're like, yeah, we've been here a lot. You know, we get a little sick and tired sometimes of asking a lot of the, you know, newbie questions because you can find those in the search bar, you know, but we're still here and we're still interacting with each other. But we tend to do it again in, you know, those private forums and things like that where we're having conversations with ourselves. Yeah. And I think the the new the new goal book with like the mastermind thing, I mean, it's kind of like those are like almost like self-grown within those people. So it's like there's generations of bigger pockets users that have come in at different stages. And like you kind of get to know each other from seeing those their posts and reaching out and sharing stories. And um, I think that's such an, a resource that people don't realize when they come in and they only do a couple posts and then they get out. They're, they're not only experiencing such a small part of what the forums have to offer. It's so true. So true. Well, dude, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, yeah. just, man, it's been uh, it's been great to hear your story, your journey, the struggles, the wins, the everything. Like you just uh, you're a very open, real, honest guy. So you know, thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, having me on. It's been a lot of fun, and hopefully, people can learn from some of the experiences we've been through and uh, understand that you know when you have those hardships, there's there's a way forward. So yeah, you need to make a board game detailing uh, the way you put your business <laughs> together. <laughs> Uh, it, would, it would probably be really complicated with lots of rules <laughs> and take hours to play. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you, James. This was a great interview today. I think we got a lot of good information. I appreciate you having on here. Hopefully we can uh, check back with you in a couple of years and see how things are going. Awesome. Uh, that being said, this is David Green for Brandon Mike Tyson Turner signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.